Ozero, back to Ukraine and Moldova in 2024. Chapter 2, Vina, War. In before starting, a series of disclaimer for you. Here's a second disclaimer about reporting and vlogging from Ukraine. In case you want to deepen up the whole topic, please check the link down below. Considering the nature of the topic and the potential criticism, please take a careful look at this third disclaimer. Thank you. Buongiorno o buonasera a tutti. Oggi è l'8 luglio 2024. Ho deciso di fare questa introduzione in italiano, uh, questo titolo in inglese, per far partire forse il più delicato dei miei video e per far cercare di capire di più il concetto delle persone a me più vicine, i miei connazionali. In questo video parlerò di per quanto sia stato possibile farlo, di cosa io abbia assistito associabile alla guerra in Ucraina, risultato dell'invasione su larga scala da parte della federazione russa avvenuta il 24 febbraio 2022. Non voglio perdermi discussioni di tipo storico, politico, sociale, linguistico, eccetera, relative a come si è arrivati a questo punto oggi, relative alla situazione attuale della guerra. Non mi interessa, sarebbe un discorso troppo lungo e off topic. Non voglio inoltre perdere tempo nel discutere di come sia stata sinora dal 24 febbraio 2022 ad oggi la guerra di per sé, i suoi crimini molteplici causati dalla federazione russa. Non voglio nemmeno discutere delle opinioni delle quali potremmo essere d'accordo o in disaccordo al merito di questi eventi. Dico solo che sono abbastanza formato sulla questione dell'Ucraina contemporanea questo è frutto di interesse personale, al netto argomento, di oltre una decina di viaggi effettuati da sottoscritto in uh, Ucraina negli ultimi dieci rotti anni e di molto altro ancora. Il mio ritorno in Ucraina tra aprile e maggio 2024 non aveva come assoluta priorità uh, le ragioni dello scoprire lo stato della guerra in corso. Ovviamente però questo risultava complementare. Nel senso che questa mia visita avveniva comunque in un paese, come ho già spiegato nei video precedenti e successivi, dove per la prima volta vi era applicata la legge marziale e vi erano delle azioni di guerra in atto aperte nel nord-est del paese. Non essendo la mia prima volta, quindi certi posti li ho, li ho appunto evitati, Uh, per cercare di limitare i miei rischi, uh, considerando comunque che era un paese in guerra. Come dirò nel video, ho stipulato per i miei giorni di permanenza nel territorio ucraino uh, una polizza assicurativa uh, che si trova tranquillamente sul sito ukraine.ua da valore di 30.000 euro di premio, uh, il quale comprendeva anche, e sottolineo, l'eventuale rimpatrio del mio cadavere qualora io fossi deceduto a causa di azioni militari russe. E non voglio essere tacciato di protagonismo, ma non ci siamo andati molto distanti, sia a livello di spazio e di tempo. Non è protagonismo, rinnovo, è mera fattualità. Ero ad Odessa il 29 aprile 2024, giorno in cui è stato effettuato un attacco ad Odessa, che forse magari in Italia è stato rilanciato col titolo di attacco al castello di Harry Potter, perché la struttura appunto ricordava un qualcosa del, delle varie saghe di Harry Potter. Quindi la distanza a livello spaziale è stata di circa 2 km e a livello temporale di circa qualche ora. Quindi non è protagonismo, ero effettivamente ad Odessa quel giorno in cui è venuta tale strage. Sottolineo che in questa guerra io non sono filo nulla, uh, sono pro-Ucraina da sempre per quanto concerne l'indipendenza dello Stato, delle sue istituzioni, la libertà delle sue persone, di poter decidere il proprio futuro democraticamente da sempre, come lo sono di qualsiasi Stato democratico. Uh, non lo dico questo per ragioni di tifo calcistico, uh, ma per una questione di estremo rispetto verso uno Stato dove è stato moltissime volte pieno di brava gente che mi ha sempre accolto senza patemi e spesso con molto entusiasmo in moltissime città, luoghi diversi del paese, sempre in maniera cordiale, senza patemi, giudizi o questioni di tipo negativo in generale. 
e senza quei eh, connotati insulti derogatori eh, che leggo al merito degli ucraini eh, con una narrativa tipicamente detta dal Cremlino da sempre. Sappiamo quali sono, non voglio ripetere in questi video. Non ho intenzione che questo video venga inutilmente dirottato verso certe opinioni che sono estremamente polarizzate, tipiche dei titoli clickbait uh, online, delle fogne chiamate social media, uh, opinioni orrende, eh, limite della mancanza totale di umanità, mancanza totale di empatia, di gente che deve polarizzare il discorso a o tutto nero o tutto bianco, uh, senza sfumature, senza complessità. Non voglio dovermi trovare a dare spiegazioni semplicistiche per problemi o storie complesse, questo non è il mio compito e odio di solito chi cerca di semplicizzare tutto quanto a qualcosa di semplice, come se fosse uno slogan. Quello l'ha già fatto Putin, appunto, dichiarando di invadere l'Ucraina per denazificarla. Quindi non voglio abbassarmi a tale livello. Uh... Per cortesia, cerchiamo di evitare la propaganda più becera da parte del Cremlino. Non soprattutto del Cremlino, ma soprattutto visto quello che accade in Italia dei tantissimi lacchè del Cremlino, che siano essi giornalisti, esperti vari, accademici, influencer, youtuber, uh, personalità politiche, uh, personalità famose in generale. Non voglio dare spazio a questa manica di complici perché li ritengo complici in questa tragedia, mentre la gente muore. Rispettosamente, con la di disaccordo, il mio consiglio è appunto di evitare la visione, dedicarvi ad altro, vi auguro le migliori cose, e appunto potete tranquillamente evitare di vedere questo video. Uh, come ho già detto eh, in precedenza, uh, l'8 luglio 2024, oggi, tra le varie cose successe in questa giornata è stato bombardato l'ospedale pediatrico di Kiev, uh, Oktmadet. Al momento della registrazione il bilancio di 29 vittime. Non si sa ancora quanti feriti siano sotto le macerie e diversi di essi sono dei bambini malati. La loro colpa non si sa. Uh, chiedetelo al Cremlino, uh, alle sue invasioni, alle sue occupazioni, ai decenni di ingerenza in Ucraina, alla, al colonialismo prima e al neocolonialismo che sta cercando di attuare adesso, alla grande lista di crimini, uh, alla loro idea malata di mondo russo, che è appunto al Cremlino, alla loro visione del mondo e alla loro sfera di influenza, al loro terrorismo verso la popolazione civile ucraina che continua purtroppo in perterito da oltre due anni. Quello arrabbiate questi quesiti, beh, chiedetelo loro. Detto questo, scusate se ho preso molto tempo, vi auguro buona visione. Saluti. And here's a quick map of all the places I've seen just in Kiev. Discussing about the war in Ukraine is a tough topic. And of course, from my own end, the story starts in 2022. Krakow is the first big city from the Ukrainian border. The one with the biggest airport in the area, the one which actually has the largest Ukrainian community in southeastern Poland. As much as this information can sound very obvious right now, nobody could ever expect it the direct consequences of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine in the city for the months to come. As I kind of anticipated and I want to highlight again for the last time, this is my own personal story within the whole big story of a full-scale invasion of Ukraine. In Krakow, like in other places throughout all of Poland, a lot of people started to cooperate and help people who were fleeing Ukraine as a result of a full-scale invasion. The main railway station of Krakow, Dwoches Gówne, actually was the main theater where most of people were passing by, arriving from Przemysl. An enormous amount of people contributed in this big chain of solidarity throughout all Poland me and other friends of mine included. As a result of personal contribution in this Solidarity Act, I've been on March 5th of 2022 to the border city of uh, Przemysl and Medica to help out people who actually ask for help. 
as you can see by these images, the situation at the border town was actually very hard. I'm not gonna mention the people behind these messages, but thank you to each single one of you for your own concern. Mind that I'm just including four messages from four different people, but the sample of people not recommending me to go to Ukraine was much larger. To conclude quickly, the last premise I want to add is that for the first time ever in all the trips I did to Ukraine, I actually wanted to stipulate an insurance policy from visitukraine.ua website, which covered 30,000 euro of expenses, including the repatriation of my body in the event of death. Yes, this needs to be added. Aside from this Russian missile, which was shot down by Ukrainian defense forces in the Ukrainian city of Slovyansk, in the east of the country, and later brought to Lviv and donated and turned into a monument, the signs to be in a country at war, in a country in a regime of martial law, are there and evident. Of course, without contravening what has been said in the second disclaimer about reporting and vlogging Ukraine under martial law, I'll try my best to tell you what actually I witnessed there. The first obvious thing you can notice, and I can obviously tell you, are the cover monuments, covered to avoid being bombed by Russians. That means that also the Polish legacy monuments, like this monument of Adam Minkiewicz, is covered and protected. Imagine having the same kind of protection or fence applied to your main cultural sites in your own hometown. This happens already in Lviv, but imagine having this. As you might have imagined from the lack of content provided in the first video and in the third one, this is the video where actually I'm highlighting just the war consequences. Here's Likakiv Cemetery, a cemetery you already saw in the first video. And in this cemetery, there are two sections where you can see the tributes towards all of the victims of the Russian invasion since 2014 and the full-scale invasion since 2022. All of the people you will see in these video frames are actually part of the people who have been defending the country for all the last 10 years just because they were serving in the army. One thing which I was sadly fondly curious about was to realize the scale of the death toll of Ukrainian defenders, not in terms of amount, not in terms of data, but rather to find out the impact that they could have had on me, a regular person who never witnessed war in his own life. Another obvious consequence of being in a country at war, in a country which has martial law or restricted areas, I wanted to go back to this place where I took this picture in 2015, and actually right now it's just a restricted area and I'm not allowed to enter it. As I mentioned before, to realize the scale of war, you need to see several things. Rivna is the capital of a regional homonymous oblast, the Rivna oblast. And in front of the theater Ukraina, you can actually see all of these defenders who died to serve our nation. The scale of the death toll can be also seen in numerous villages like this one and the cemeteries. These flags are symbolizing some people who went to defend their country, was killed, murdered, and then it was brought back home to be buried. Also in Kolomia, close to the Pisanka Museum, in one of the main roads close to the center, there was the display of defenders who died from the area at the front. In Kyiv, in front of the St. Michael's Golden Dome Monastery, there are pictures explaining events of the war, rest of vehicles, and afterwards, probably one of the saddest things I've ever seen. As written above, here is a memory wall of the fallen defenders of Ukraine in Russian-Ukrainian war. These people were servants of the country, regular soldiers of different kind, 
and they all died in front trying to defend and protect their own country. The list, as you will see, is enormous. And I would like just to give a moment of silence from now on. Another infamous place, infamous nowadays, of course, which is the Arka Zvobode Ukrainskogo Narodu, or, well, the so called rainbow shaped arc to honor the friendship between Russia and Ukraine, which is a bit obsolete nowadays, as you might think. There was a monument of a friendship between Russia and Ukraine. And here's what happens when you betray that friendship. Like it's not a visit to Paris without seeing Eiffel Tower, it is not a visit to Ukraine and Kyiv without going to Maidan Nezhnosti. To be honest, in the past I had many fun moments in the square. Right now, especially that day, it felt all sad. And I guess it was in the rain. In the Petrovsk Lavra Cathedral, one of the most important Orthodox churches in the whole world, there is an exhibition showing the extent of damages happening to religious sites in Ukraine. Not even religious sites are safe from the barbaric action of a war. From now on, you will also see other set of exhibitions all of those located in the proximity of a Ukrainian motherland monument. For example, right now you will see a set of vehicles. Some of those were for civilian use, some of those for military use. In any case, they all have been impacted by war and have been damaged. And here is an image from the park hosting the Ukrainian Marvel Monument. As you can see, this tank has ridden Namoksvu, so to Moscow. If 
few steps away from that tank and considering the rainy weather of that day, I considered going to the so-called local conflicts museum where there was an exhibition which I honestly would like to define as this poster called Ukraine, the Shield of Europe. The exhibition was hosted on three floors, like the building's one, and on the ground floor there were the Russian documents, the Russian objects, as I would like to define. Documents explaining how Russians wanted to kill people in a very organized way, in a sadly very organized way. Documents proving the allegiance of soldiers. Personal objects, insignia demonstrating the Z propaganda from Russia, and much more, like shells and other found objects from either killed Russians or captured Russians. And yeah, I forgot, also invasion plans. And as you can see from this picture of a Russian missile on the ground, now you'll see some Russian weapons collected in that same room. As I said before, the exhibition was on different levels of the building. On the first floor, you could see actually the Western weapons, which have been delivered to defend Ukraine and supported by the West. Some other messages from President Zelensky, some pictures in general, and also rests of destroyed items, destroyed objects from Russians.
After apologizing for over two minutes of silence from my own end, there was a third part of the exhibition, which was held in the basement, and I have to thank uh, the local guy to push me to go, because honestly, I thought it was over. And over there in the basement, there was a set of exhibition which I found extremely sad and hard to digest, which showed how people in the city of Ostomel, famous for the anonymous battle of Ostomel during the first days of war, were held captive during Russian occupation in the attempt to try to get to Kyiv during the first days of war. The very next day I took a metro to get to the Memorial Park of Babi Yar. In 1941, 33,000 people were killed here during the Holocaust and it's part of the Nazi Germany genocide on Jews. And during the rest of the war, a lot more people were killed between prisoner of war, Romani people and other Jews. The tower you see in the background is the TV tower of Kyiv. It is 385 meters high, it is the tallest building in all of Ukraine, and on March 1st, 2022, it was hit by a Russian missile strike, which killed, in the process, five people. After Babi Yar Memorial, I decided to go spend the day and visit the sites of Irpin and Bucha. I don't think you don't need any introduction about those two cities, which right now are hero cities of Ukraine. And yeah, let's start following the images. Here is the famous bridge on Irpin River on the way from Kyiv to Irpin. On the second day of invasion, on February 25th, this was blown up by the Ukrainian military in order to avoid Russian troops to get to the closer central part of Kyiv. Okay. This led to the fact that there were a lot of battles between the residents of the people and the Russian army who was occupying and creating a huge line to try to get to the central part of Kyiv. 
This bridge also was a place of salvation, as said later on, because a lot of people tried to evacuate from here. And despite being most of them just civilians, the Russian troops tried to target them and shoot at them. Basically, three people died here, a uh, family, a mother and two, two children, during a shelling. And, and yeah, it's possibly one of the saddest things I've ever seen. Imagine being here during those days while Russian troops were trying to invade Kyiv and having tremendous fights with local defenders and civilians. You are probably extremely scared, this place was extremely crowded and you're just under a bridge which was blown up in order to try to be evacuated as soon as possible. This probably has been a severe trauma for a lot of people and I can't even imagine how those 40,000 people which were evacuated from here felt during those days. The bridge on the Irpin River, while approaching by walking the city of Irpin, I ended up emitting several things. First, I saw this road sign full of bullet holes, meaning that here there was for sure a weapon confront between forces. Second to that, I saw this ad from Azov Battalion, one of the many ads you will see and one of the many ads I will talk about later in an explanation from my side in dual Italian English. And later on, I saw this deposit of cars, which are now taken care of and visited. All of them look rusty, all of them were destroyed during the occupation of Irpin and Bucha. Uh, hi Irpin! In case you're wondering why did I say hi Irpin while showing Irpin, actually it's because I know a person originally from Irpin and I wanted to greet the person from the person's hometown. Just that. Of course, further more signs of Russian occupation are evident here. In case you're wondering, yes, that's a bomb alert and yes, that's me passing through. In case you don't believe me, here's a notification I got on Telegram about that bomb alert. Here you can see a university building destroyed, followed by three nice cats I met on the street. Another building with windows destroyed at a crossroad. A fence with bullet holes. In nearby Dupki Park, at the end of Irpin, where is this inflatable up with a team of angry birds. It would be awesome if all wars in all mankind would be just about the funny game like angry birds. But sadly, most of them are not. And here is a building of a central stadium, uh, which was also destroyed during the occupation from Russians. As you can see, uh, most of the windows were destroyed, holes in the poles, holes in the wall. The 
the facade also has been ruined because of that and the interior is not fully possible to be visited because inside it has been burned as you can see from the other side aside from very painting uh, it was destroyed too and here are we are at the end of Irpin The beginning of Bucha coincides with the beginning of Voxana Street. Voxana Street is the place where actually the Ukrainian army on 27th of February 2022 stopped the convoy, the famous convoy from Belarus of the Russian army. Bucha back then looked like this. Nowadays it looks like this. Walking in a complete new rebuilt Voxana Street was a bit strange as well as walking generally in Bucha this was a former Soviet memorial which is turning into a memorial for Ukraine here is a building destroyed again aside from this cafe Italian advertisement walking throughout Bucha is like walking in a city full of remembrance for the many people who suffer here. The next destination from my own end was to get to the Church of All Saints. I haven't got to all the places signaled in online guides. Over here, part of a genocide happened. 116 people were killed, including women and two children was being shot at the head. The church itself also have some tiny evidence still of having been hit by bullets or weapons as you can see here. Imagine shooting to a church because this happened here in Bucha. Look I tried to get inside, but it was closed. And I tried just to figure it out what was actually inside right now. And there are many pictures of what actually happened in these days in Bucha. But on the western side, there is actually the most important part of my visit in Bucha. There is the memorial of the 116 victims. Their bodies were found out in a mass grave which soon you'll be able to see there are still missing people from those days and here are the 116 names here is the mass grave a moment of silence for the victims of the genocide After that, my quick daily trip to Irpin and Bucha was over and I tried to go back by taxi to Kiev. Where are you from? Italy. But where I was heading with a taxi, of course, back to finally a sunny version of my Danish Legionosti, the Independence Square. And I decided to visit some places connected with uh, Revolution of Dignity, starting by the nearby Lviv Gate. Over there, you can see uh, the, hev the so called heavily hundreds, so 100 plus people who died in the demonstration of a so-called revolution of dignity. 
in Ukraine happened in the end of 2013 till February 2014. Here is a series of explanations in dual language, of course, with uh, pictures and descriptions. Walking up, there is the memorial church, let's say temple, of a heavenly hundred. As you can see here, uh, there is a series of religious tributes to this heavenly hundred who participated actively and sadly lost their lives during the revolution of dignity. Just behind the famous Ukraine Hotel behind Maidan Nezhelezhnosti. Guess who operates still in Russia? This motherfucker. I would like now to thank my friend Eugenia who recommended me to go to Veterano Pizza. The pizza there was awesome, and I'm an Italian, so I can confirm this. On April 28th, 2024, I've been to this demonstration where all of these people were asking about the freedom from captivity of the Azov-style steel mill defenders. Everyone who came to this demonstration, like many others organized in the city in different places, were asking overall for the freedom of a POW of other stall. Later that day, I saw the same military vehicles I saw a few days before in front of uh, St. Michael's Monastery. The very same night, I had a train from Kiev to Odessa, and in the early morning of the very next day, I arrived to a place where actually is very infamous in history because of a massacre of a trade union house and as you can see here's the trade union house well there despite all of the difficulties the spirit of odessa is still there striving and untouched it have in a sid Meier civilization too aggressive then somebody has to stop it like we did here kudos ukraine that day april 29 2024 i just had a few hours to visit the city in before catching up the bus to Kishinev after having got there just in the early morning from kiev by train that means that i had to basically speed up and get to the potionkin stairs and afterwards, I actually wanted to go to the sea and just chill out because I really needed to go to the sea 
Also, my feet were actually hurting a bit because of blisters. Ah, it's fucking cold. As you can see by these images, those few hours I had in Odessa were actually fantastic. I really love the time there. But a few hours later, when I got to Chisinau, to Moldova, I discovered that something terrible actually happened just a few hours since I left. In this terror attack from Russia, four people died, 32 were injured, and a dog also died. God really blessed their souls. After my time in Moldova, which you'll see in a different video, I went back to Ukraine, to the city of Chernitsy, also trying to approach return back home to Krakow. While returning back from Chernitsy, heading back to Krakow in Poland, I had my very last alert from Lviv region on my phone. Once at the border in Poland, I saw this man approaching the way back to Ukraine. Who knows what the destiny of this man is. Citando il secondo tragico fantozzi della scheda della Yonkin, la guerra russa in Ucraina è una cagata pazzesca. Fine è stata 6, però 48 anni dopo forse era giusto aggiornare il testo. In case you want a visual of how deeply I feel about the war in Ukraine, well, there you have it through these images. Honestly, I thought that probably this is cannot be the best message to be delivered or probably this image of me shooting at the face of Putin may be not enough good to be a good ending or probably again uh, this image from this bus in Odessa may be not the greatest thing possible that's why I bought a magnet with a very recognizable image which if I do remember correctly, sounds something like this. Yeah, can't disagree with that.